And let's ask the Lord to speak to us tonight through his word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. It's our desire to learn from your word, to be washed by your word, to be transformed and changed by your word. Lord, we ask that we would not only be comforted and instructed by it, but Lord, that you would also empower us and equip us to be more effective ministers and teachers for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Okay, so we've been talking about the Ten Commandments. We have been dealing with the First Commandment, and we have been talking about the background of that First Commandment being the Ten Plagues that the Israelites went through in Egypt. They saw the power, they saw the glory of God. God wanted to demonstrate his ability and re-identify himself to his own people. Remember, they had been 400 years in Egypt. They did not grow up knowing the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So he has to reintroduce himself to them and show forth his power. And more importantly, his supremacy over each of the gods that they had learned how to trust. By the way, that's exactly the same thing that the Lord wants to do in your life as your disciple. Slowly as you come to know Him more, slowly as He is able to, because you allow Him to, impose Himself into your life, you begin to learn that you don't have to trust those things that you did before. You begin to learn that you don't have to trust those habits you had before. All those idols and all those gods that you used to have, that you used to run to for refreshment, you used to run to for comfort, you used to run to for, uh, 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 you know, whatever it, it was that served your need. Slowly, as you're discipled by the Lord, you find out that He is actually the one who fills every single one of those needs. And He becomes our God in every single respect. And so He winds up doing the same thing in our lives as He did in the case of the children uh, uh, of Israel in Egypt. Now, they go through the nine plagues, and they finally come to the last one. This is where we left off last week. Exodus chapter 10, verse 28. The locusts have come. The darkness that could be felt has come. Pharaoh has seen that the God of Moses has command over every single one of these natural things that the gods of Egypt were supposed to be, uh, 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 have power over. And finally, at last, he still refuses to let the people go. He doesn't ardent, ardently refuse. He begins to see and recognize that God is a true God. And so he tries to bargain with him, just as we try to bargain with him sometimes, when we recognize, yes, he is a mighty God. Yes, he is a great God. But I still have these desires, and I still have these drives, and I still want to satisfy myself my own way. So we try to bargain with him, and how about if I give into this but not give into this, and this part of my life I give you, but that part of my life I'll hold back. And if there's one thing that God tries to impose on his people, and we should take from the lesson that the Israelites go through, it is this. Thou shalt have no gods before me. Thou shalt have no Elohim. That which has power in your life, that which has influence in your life, that which has the ability to choose and make decisions in your life, thou shalt have no other gods, no other Elohim for me. That's what God is trying to show here. Now, Moses tells Pharaoh that he must let God's people go 100% all the way. Pharaoh refuses. And then Pharaoh... He takes a different turn. He's never been like this before. But in Exodus chapter 10, verse 28, Pharaoh looks at Moses and says, Get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. He threatens to kill Moses if he ever sees him again. Now this is beyond where Pharaoh has gone before. Now he threatens with death the life of God's prophet. And in response... To Pharaoh's threat of God's prophet of death, he pronounces the final, most terrible plague, Exodus chapter 11, verse 5. God says, every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the slave girl who is at her hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well, it does not matter. God is not involved in class warfare. Poor, 
rich, middle, everybody in between, all are going to taste his wrath because Pharaoh has angered him. And you want to introduce death? You want to play death games with me? I mean, you know, this is like you don't want to, you don't want to box with God because your arms are, are too short to do that. So Pharaoh brings it on himself. Seemingly, Pharaoh curses himself, his own son, and his kingdom with his pronouncement. Now, question. How often is it possible, and if so, how often, do we curse ourselves by how we choose to respond to God and how we treat others and speak to others and the things we do to other people? Pharaoh brings this upon himself. Is it possible, and if so, how is it done, for us to elucidate the same thing? Pharaoh curses himself. Is it possible that we can curse ourselves as well? And the world around us. In, you don't have to turn there, but in 2 Samuel chapter 12, David is dealing with the prophet Nathan. And God has given David... Everybody's familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba. God has given David a year to come clean. Sometimes people sin a great sin before God. And God in His mercy will give them time, will cause things to happen in their life in order to steer their heart and steer their mind towards repentance, to give them a chance to make it right before He, God, has to act. But instead of his heart softening towards the Lord and turning to God in repentance and confessing the sin. Instead, David hardens his heart and actually tells himself, ha ha, I've gotten away with it. Nobody found out. I've gotten away with it. And then into the throne room comes Nathan. And in 2 Samuel 12, 13, in the preceding verses, Nathan tells him a story about a man who takes the sheep of his servant and kills it for his friends, even though he has other sheep. And David says, as surely as I am king, this man shall die this very day. And what does Nathan say to David? Anybody know? Thou art the man. Say that with me. Thou art the man. This is what, God, this is what, God, this is what Nathan says to David. Thou art the man. You are the guy who I'm talking about. And David tears his clothes, which is a sign of remorse for a Jew. And in 2 Samuel 12, 13, David says to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan replies, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. David makes a mistake, and God pronounces a sentence upon him. David sinned with Bathsheba, and now their son was taken. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 10, David again, the man after God's own heart, is threatened with war, and so rather than trust in God, because God has already told him he's going to have the victory here, he doesn't really believe it. And so he sends his captains and his soldiers out to count the soldiers. Even though God has already said, you're going to have victory, that's not enough for David. It's not enough for David that God has said, you're going to win. I want to know how I'm going to win. I want to see it. And so he sends his servants out to count and number the soldiers of Israel. And God gets honked off at this. Why? Because it shows a lack of trust in God's word. And as a result... In 2 Samuel 24, 10, David was conscience-stricken after he had counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, O Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad, the prophet, David's seer. Verse 12 says, go and tell David this is what the Lord says. I'm going to give you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. I mean, you would love to have this choice. So, 
Verse 13, Gad went uh, to David and said to him, Shall there come upon you three years of famine? Three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you? Or three days of plague in your land? Now think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I'm in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me into the fall of the hand. Do not, do not let me fall into the hands of men. Praise God. Finally, wisdom. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated, and seventy thousand men from Dan to Beersheba died. David makes a mistake, causes God's pronouncement. Seventy thousand people die. In the first case, his son dies because of a mistake he made. In the second case, 70,000 people die. We see this kind of thing happen throughout the Old Testament. Even in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 5, there's a story of Ananias and Sapphira. Everybody's selling all their property to give it to the Lord's, uh, 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 to the apostles, to, 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 to share with the community. And Ananias comes and says, we sold a piece of property. Here's all the money from the property. Now look. Ananias did not have to do that. He could have easily said, I sold this property and half of it I am giving to the church. Trust me, if any of you want to sell your property and give half of it to the church, that would be more than enough. Okay? Here's the problem. He kept back some of it, but he tells Peter this is all of it. And Peter says, you have not lied to me, but you've lied to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Ananias croaks, dies, falls on the ground. A little while later, Sapphira, his wife, comes in looking for Ananias. And Peter greets her and asks her, by the way, Sapphira, the money that you gave, was that all of it? Ah, uh, yeah, uh, that was all of it. Really? Well, now the same thing that happened to your husband is going to happen to you. <clears throat> and she dies. Okay? Bad things happen when you cross God sometimes. Old Testament and new. Question. Were these people cursed? Is this a curse? In order to answer that question, you have to be able to answer this. What is a curse? The Bible talks about it all the time. It's mentioned hundreds of times. In the Old Testament... 400, approximately 400 times the word bless and blessing is used. Approximately 300 times the word curse is used. So there are a, there's a lot of blessing going on in the Old Testament, and there's a lot of curse. God uses curses. People curse. People bless. God blesses. What is a curse, and can you have one operating in your life? And if so, how do you get rid of it? What is a curse? All right, everybody turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the story of Adam and Chava. That's the Hebrew pronunciation for Adam and Eve. They sin against God. They're tempted by the serpent. And the reason I cite this passage is this is the first time in Scripture that we see the word curse used. It's right here in verse 14, Genesis 3, 14. And the Lord said to the servant, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all other cattle. Cursed. You are cursed. So the serpent is cursed. The Hebrew word for cursed here is ah. Uh, remember, this is left to right, so it's kind of uh, arur. Say that with me, arur. It's almost like there's a ghost L in the in the uh, the vav. This is actually a vav, uh, but it's pronounced u in Hebrew. Arur. Curse it, arur. It means. A pronouncement of destruction by God. By who? It's 
I'll leave, by the way. It's for Eloki. Every Hebrew letter in many root words actually represent another word. Ah, Ur. Pronouncement of destruction by Elohim. Elohim is now going to use his power. Elohim is now going to use his authority. Elohim is now going to flex and impose himself in a spiritual, intellectual, emotional, and physical way to bring about destruction in a certain way, how he decides to pronounce this is going to be. Arur, pronouncement of destruction. This goes beyond the removal of protection. There can be where God removes his protection, but that is not this. This is the imposition of his power. This is the imposition of his judgment. This is the imposition of his wrath. He's mad about something. He's upset about something. And he is pronouncing destruction as a result of an action that has been taken. In the case of this, the Nahash. The serpent, uh, Nachash is Hebrew for corrupter, the corrupter. He who or that which corrupts. So in answer to the theological question, do we know it was a snake? Well, I think it was represented by a snake, as we're going to see as he fleshes out this pronouncement, this arur. But all the word Nachash means is just he who corrupts or that which corrupts. Nachashim is what they use for, like, wizard. Uh, for instance, uh, when... In, in, in Exodus, uh, Yannis and Yambers come and oppose Moses, and he throws down the rod, and it changes into a serpent. And the other, uh, they, the, the other seers, the other uh, warlocks, the other wizards, they throw theirs down. Uh, uh, Pharaoh says, I am not uh, 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 astonished by this because my Menachashim can do that. My workers of the occult, my Menachashim, it's, it's the same root word as Nachash, he who corrupts, can do that. So it goes beyond a removal of protection. Spiritual force is released by Elohim. His Elohistic power is released in a destructive and a negative way. Spiritual forces begin to orchestrate things. And as we can see from the Old Testament, things like health, things like circumstances, situations, finances, all can be affected by the arur pronouncement, pronouncement of destruction by Elohim. When somebody is cursed by God, when something is cursed by God, God has proclaimed and pronounced that they are guilty of something and has released His authority, activated His authority and His spiritual power to destroy. To, to, to destroy. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual destruction. The worst, eternal destruction. All these released by the arur, pronouncement of destruction by God. This word is what we translate as curse. So what is a curse in essence? A curse is the enactment, I should write that down, the enactment, or actually I'm going to change it. The activation and pronouncement of destruction by God. Ah. Now, let's take a look at verse 14. Let's look at this more closely. So the Lord God says to the servant, Lord, Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Heh, Yahweh, Elohim, says to the serpent, the Nakash, because you have done this, you are cursed. You are a ruler. So who is cursed? What is cursed? The serpent. So number one we see, I'm going to use another color. Serpent. You are cursed, he says. The serpent, you, you, you. You are a ruler. You are cursed. More than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. And here it comes. Here's the pronouncement. On your belly you shall go. You shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is God's pronouncement. This is God's pronouncement of destruction. God has now told the Nakash what is going to happen to him. 
That's the arur. That's the curse. You are cursed with a curse. He says he's going to curse the serpent. Now he's explaining and expressing what that curse is. To the woman, he says. So first, arur comes to the serpent. Next, who does the arur come to? The woman. Chava, Eve. To her, to the woman, he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. How many women would say amen? That happened. I mean, imagine, this is the way God had originally designed it. You, Nancy, were supposed to be able to have Carly just out. I mean, like Enoch, you know, she was and then she was not. Chariot of fire carries her out of there. Instead, there is exactly what God says. Multiplied sorrow and your conception in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So part of the uh, roar is saddling women with men. Is that right? Kind of looks like that, right? What do you mean, amen? This is my sister Mary. Okay, fine then. Then to Adam, he says, now watch this carefully. Because there's going to be a little switch here. Then to Adam, he says, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. So, man, what should you never do? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Kidding, kidding, kidding. Joke, joke. JK. You have eaten from the tree which I command you, saying you shall not eat of it. Therefore, cursed is the what? The ground. This word is slightly different. This word is... So again, it says, reading right to left. Rah. It is cursed because of you. Ah, lur. Serpent, cursed. Woman, cursed. In the case of Adam, ah, ra the eretz, the earth is cursed. Cursed is the ground for your sake. I curse the ground to curse you. Is the man being cursed or is the ground being cursed? To me, does it matter? It's like, okay, Ian, I'm not going to curse you. I'm just going to curse the oxygen and take it all away. So I'm actually not cursing you. I'm just cursing the atmosphere. There isn't any more. Well, okay. Yeah, your curse is against the atmosphere, not me. But I'm affected. And in this case, the earth, the irates, is affected. You shall not eat of it, he says. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, here comes the arur. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. Dust you are, and dust you shall return. I don't care. I, my, I, my friend at Wheaton College says there's a difference here, and Arur and Arurra, it's, it's different, and one, they're cursing. And I got to tell you. To Adam, not only is the earth cursed, but now from dust you came, and now dust you will return. Now you're going to die. To me, I don't see a difference. In the end, it's still the same root word. Elohim activates and pronounces destruction in response to something they have done. The power and authority of God was at that point released to activate those modes of destruction upon Adam and all his posterity to follow. Now, here's what I need you to observe. Snakes still crawl. Women, childbirth still hurts. Earth, still producing weeds. 
men still die. Everything God said that was not is now. Men did not die before, but after the arur of God, they do. Men were, women were not supposed to have pain in childbirth, but after the arur of God, now they do. Serpents did not crawl on their bellies at the time, apparently, but now they do. Emnity between Jesus, the seed of the woman, and the serpent, still going on to this day. The arur of God, once it is spoken, continues. Cain is also arur. He is cursed. We see a lot of curse. Now, here's the thing. All of these curses happen long before Sinai and the Ten Commandments. Is that important? Yes. Because these are curses that pertain to spiritual law. God offended, he pronounces destruction. There are also other curses that God pronounces in conjunction with the law. I.e., if you break the law, you're going to be cursed. By the way, can I just... Almost out of time. Um... Can I throw in this one thing? God can use curses in negative ways and also in positive ways. How do you say God can use a curse in Arur in a positive way? In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, God introduces to Abraham the covenant, the agreement, the blood agreement between himself and Abraham and his people. And this is what he says in Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3. He says, Now the Lord has said to Abraham, Get out of your country, Ur, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will do what? I will bless those who bless you. And I, Elohim, will curse those who curse you. Now, this introduces an interesting idea. People can curse each other. If a curse, as defined by scriptural Hebrew, means the activation and pronouncement of destruction by God, is it a curse for me to say to somebody, oh man, I hope your hair falls out. Is that a curse? No, not by Jewish definition. A curse is, may God Almighty cause your hair to fall out. Now I am invoking God and God's power, which is the core of an arur curse. And I'm invoking his power upon you, upon somebody who angers me and they have their gods now God says he who curses you Israel any Jew any descendant of Abraham's he who curses you I will curse if there is anybody who is going to crawl call out to their gods and cry down punishment and destruction and pronounce destruction upon you I am going to curse them I, Elohim, am going to be beset against them, and I'm going to set myself against them. By the way, according to Galatians, who has inherited the promises of Abraham now? Who? Point to your neighbor and go, you. Point back to your neighbor and go, you. You too. We, if, we, if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You now, as a believer, blood-bought and spirit-filled, have spiritually been put in the same position as Abraham. Where God's promise on you, Bud Meyer, is, I am going to bless you if you will just give me your life and go where I tell you to. I'm not going to tell you ahead of time all the particulars, and I'm going to tell you, you today you're going to turn left and tomorrow you're going to turn right. I'm not going to give you that kind of detail. But if you will give me your life and just promise to go where I send you, I will bless you. 
whoever blesses you, I will bless, so treat him good. And whoever curses you, I will curse. A curse, to summarize tonight, is the activation and pronouncement of destruction by God. And that pronouncement can be made by God or can be made by a representative of God. To the Jews, a curse, a rur, was always a pronouncement that engaged and activated the power of God. Why? Two minutes, I'm going to answer that question by asking you to turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Is this interesting to everybody, anybody besides me? This is, this is to help us understand how the power of God and spiritual force works as it is defined by Scripture. I think it's vital to understand this because there is too much uh, shipai, is a good word for it, being thrown around about curses. And I don't know, for me, it's like it's real simple. These aren't hard words to understand. But because, of, because people don't understand what a curse is, they start all applying all sorts of, or all sorts of weirdness to it. This is the essence of a curse and a blessing. Romans chapter 4, verse, seven, verse 16. Let's start with 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise, might be sure to all the seed. That's us. Not to only that which is of the law, but also that which is the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead, that is, make dead come back to life. And here's the part you need to underline. Calleth those things which be not as though they were. Let me say that again. Calleth those things which be not as though they were. In short, if God says it will happen, it will happen. Now, you and I, we have studied Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. I don't have time to review it tonight, but what we found is this. That God, in essence, when he starts this project, says, Let there be light, and there is light. Separates the light from the darkness. Creates the world. Creates the space. In essence, what he does is he manipulates matter, space, and energy. Technically, if you look at the root words of those words in Hebrew... One of them is Aramaic. What we find God does is at the beginning of this project, at the beginning of this season, at the beginning of this dispensation, if you will, God is going to come in, Elohim is going to come in, and I'm going to reorganize all the matter, I'm going to reorganize all the space, and I'm going to reorganize all the energy, and I'm going to reset it, and I'm going to reestablish it all in a new way. According to... The Hebrew exegesis, what you would expect to find in geology and archaeology is a combination of very old matter having only been placed in this position for a short time. Because that, in essence, is what Genesis chapter 1 and 2 said. What we find is this, that Elohim, is a being, eternal, loving, benevolent, that can manipulate space and matter and energy as easily as you and I can manipulate a quarter of a dime. If you saw a nickel, a quarter, and a dime on a table, and I asked you to change the order around and make it a nickel, diamond, quarter instead, how easy would it be for you? God, Elohim, can do that with protons, neutrons, and electrons. He can do that with wavelengths and amplitude and energy. He can do that by folding and compressing and expanding space. If he can do that, he can do this. Call the things that are not as though they are. All God has to do is say it, and it becomes. He says it and it becomes. This is kind of a window into the nature of God. True theology. 
that he is someone who, by the force and activation of his voice, can cause things to be manipulated in physical space as well as spiritual. So when God pronounces something, it happens. Does he pronounce things as consequence for sin? Yes. Many times. If so, is there a curse going on in your life? And if so, how do you handle it? Can I give you a hint? We're going to study this next week more, but I'll give you a hint. Somebody hung on a cross became a curse for us. The curse of the law and the curse of the power of God may fall on him. You have no idea what he has done. Next week, Wednesday. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you so much. And we praise you, God, for your word. We praise you, God, for your mind. We thank you and worship you, God, for your love and your mercy and grace upon us. We ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, just as we can kind of perceive what's coming, to receive our thanks and our praise and our, and our glory to you for what you have done in removing the curse from us. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. I well, thank you for coming. I'll see you Sunday morning. Um, what time? 9.30.